coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing podcast. What do you do? And I was like, well, you do what you tell your clients to do if you ever find yourself in this horrible, easily avoidable situation. And that was just sound off like you got the biggest pair in the world and you're the baddest thing that walks that river. And at the, as that water hit me in the face, my buddy's looking down river and he just sees me just hawk out, wolverine out. And I just yelled and I smacked that bear with the tip of my fly rod. And on that second lunge, he darted to the right of me. This story and much more today on the Wet Fly Swing podcast. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how you doing today? If you get a chance, would love if you can click that subscribe button and you will get updated when our next episode drops and goes live out there. That's the easiest way to stay in touch with us. If you have any questions uh, or have an idea for a show topic, you can send me a message dave at wetflyswing.com anytime adam cuthrell is here to break down alaska and the remoteness and greatness that it offers we find out what a river trip is all about and he walks us through all the steps and digging into it the step-by-step putting one of these trips together we're talking gear we're talking fishing we're talking time of the year we're covering it all today so uh, this is a great one with adam we even get into a little uh, little depth on some cool stories, and we get a, a rundown throughout the whole year and what he has going as well. So this is going to be a big one. You know, I love Alaska, and I know a lot of people out there want to put together a trip, so i got a great resource for you here today. Um, so without further ado, here we go. Adam Cuthrell from fishhoundexpeditions.com. How's it going, Adam? Doing good, Dave. Thanks for having me. First time caller, long time listener. <laughs> That's right. That's what I love to hear. I love to hear the uh, the radio the radio analogies. It's like it's it's the greatest thing because podcasting has become it is like the new radio. It's like actually you got radio was the old way to do it, and podcasting is the new way to do it. So this is good. Um, oh, 100 percent. But uh, we're going to dig into what you have going with Fishhound. You got the, this amazing program where you take people up to these remote Alaska trips and do all this good stuff. We're going to dig into all that today, but uh, take us back quickly before we jump there and let's hear about how you got into this whole fly fishing space and and kind of Alaska and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm originally from Colorado and I started, you know, fly fishing hardcore when I was 14. My family, we grew up very outdoorsy on the weekends. We'd load up the the trailer and the BB guns and the bows and the dogs and, uh, you know, head out to the woods camping, you know, and, you know, did spin fishing, obviously, as a little kid, like most of us uh, do when we're younger, and uh, saw some guys out on the river when I was growing up, and I just figured that was something that looked awesome and wanted to get into. So when I was 14, went to uh, Walmart, bought a $20 fiberglass Eagle Claw fly rod, Mm -hmm. and uh, went out and hacked it up with some buddies, learned doing everything wrong to finally figure it out. Uh, But the first time I went fishing was on a great tailwater called the Frying Pan River in Colorado and managed to catch a little brown trout. And I was I was hooked, man, Um, where I grew up was about 10 minutes from a great trout stream and would cut school and ride our bikes (laughs) up to to go fish. And, you know, my whole friends in middle school and high school, we all fished. That's just uh, what we did. And uh, the core group of us, we. Once we got into it and we're really loving it, we're like, man, Alaska would be the place. Like, we should do that. And, uh, you know, when I was 30 years old, I finally fulfilled that dream and moved up here to AK. And uh, it's been very good to me ever since. Well, what's that transition like? Because, I mean, Colorado, obviously, we've done a ton of episodes on Colorado, and it is one of those hot spots for fly fishing. But the Alaska move is a big one, right? Because Alaska is, you go to a place where it's dark most of the year in the wintertime, right? And, it, <laughs> and it's this whole thing, right? So talk about like... Let everyone keep thinking that, please. Let <laughs> exactly. everyone keep thinking that it's dark, it's cold, we live in igloos, you don't want to be here in the winter, it's horrible, trust me. And that's what somebody said recently, they're like, man, I want to know about these bugs. Am I going to be wearing DEET, covering myself in DEET the whole time? Like, so, but you got this whole Alaska thing going, but talk about what that transition was like from Colorado to Alaska for you guys. 
You know, the the fishing aspect was definitely a transition, you know, down in Colorado and most of the Rocky Mountains, like fly fishing revolves around bugs, aquatic insects. If you know the bugs, you'll know the fish. Up here, for the most part, our trout don't grow to two feet in length by eating little tiny bugs. Yep. They eat meat. And hmm. that was the biggest transition. I remember walking into a great local fly shop when I first moved up here. I was like, hey, you know, what size tippet? You know, what size 5X, 6X do I need? What type of bugs? And the guy just kind of looks at me. He's like, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> yeah. Like, nope. Nope. Gave it away. And so, yeah, that was just kind of the biggest transition is just figuring out, you know, how these fish get to their size and what they eat. And that is through protein. So up here, it's, you know, a lot of streamers, salmon smolt, mice, um, just a little different that way as opposed to throwing, you know, 5X tippet to a size 20 parachute atoms or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. So that, so you had a whole different game as far as the fishing and, and the experience like up in Alaska, right, must be a little bit different too, but. So talk about this fish hound. So how do you go from, you know, some 14 year old in Colorado fishing with your friends to owning a, this travel or essentially, right. This remote travel business. You know, um, I got to thank a lot of it to my wife. She encouraged me to take this risk. Um, the company that I used to guide for when I first moved up here, the guy had told me that I should buy it. I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll buy it. So I looked into getting a bank loan. Uh, but when push came to shove, he didn't give the right paperwork. And I was a firefighter at the time and was kind of, you know, battling with that and the different things that come with that job. And my wife said, just do it. Start your own business. Love it. So I uh, rolled the dice. And when I started, it was me in a boat. And now I have 10 full time guides, wow. 18 boats, and five locations. So it's That's uh, amazing. Yeah. And it just kind of grew into this just through my love, my passion for this. When uh, the company that I first started for, you know, we had a couple locations where we'd go, you know, I don't want to mention any names to like yeah. downplay any oh, yeah. regions, but I'd heard of this one region was so stoked, you know, and we fly out there and we land and we're getting the boats ready. And then another beaver lands. Oh. And then 20 minutes later, another beaver lands. And then there's four jet boats and then there's four more jet boats. And by the time we put on for this first trip with this other company I worked for, there was like 30 people right there fishing. And that was not my preconceived notions of Alaska. And so when I started my business, uh, had the, you know, good grace, hard work ethic to travel to find more rivers that met my preconceived notions of Alaska, which are crystal clear water huge fish, wild salmon populations, Mm -hmm. and less people. Um, So I started doing that. And by doing that research, you know, oh, poor me, getting to travel around Alaska and fish, you know, I found these rivers that kind of met my criteria that are wild, free, and not a lot of people. And turns out a lot of people like that. And that's how we've kind of been able to grow to where we're at now. Yeah, that's right. So you're the... No, and that's a great reminder for people that maybe haven't been up there, you know, ever or recently that, yeah, Alaska, even though it's, you know, huge and gigantic and 20 million acre uh, refuge areas, it's still, you get these spots where people know and it can be busy, which is kind of crazy, right? But you're focusing on the experience of being like you're out there having, for the most part, you feel like you're in the middle of Alaska by yourself, kind of. Is that kind of what it feels like? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I mean, anywhere you go in Alaska, You know, there's always a chance of seeing someone else out there, but there still are a lot of places that don't get that much pressure because as famous as Alaska is, like you mentioned, there's these kind of these hot spots where people hear of Alaska, they do a little bit of research and like, oh, I need to go to River A and everyone and their mother is at River A. But there's so many rivers in this state where if you do a little bit more hard work, you fly in. You get out there, you know, we utilize a lot of helicopters in addition to conventional fixed wing aircraft and a helicopter really gives a lot of access as Mm. you don't need a landing strip to get there. That's right. The heli. So, so this is good. What I'd like to do here is, you know, for folks listening, just give people a little perspective. We don't have to tell any names of where these rivers are or anything, but could we dig into a little bit on just like the trip itself, like take us to somebody's coming in. And they're going to, you know, fly into Anchorage, I guess. Could you take us to that process of kind of getting there and what that takes to get to the river? 
Yeah, definitely. So as I mentioned, we do have a bunch of different trips in a variety uh, oh, right. of places throughout the Alaska. But yeah, basically. Maybe, Adam, you can just pick one. We could just say, because I know you've got some that are maybe on the mainland. you got some stuff that's over like on some islands and things like that. Wh- which one do you think it would be the one? May- maybe talk about the one that's a little bit uh, more doable. Um, what do you think we should dig into here? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, all the trips that we do are doable and all basically kind of start the same. Uh, Anchorage is the hub for Alaska. So you're going to fly into Anchorage and then depending on where we go out, we fly out the following day. So folks come up to Anchorage, stay there that night or go to one of our other bases of operation, which is about an hour flight or an easy hour to two hour drive. Guys will stay there that night. The following day, we fly out and we fly out at 9 a.m. in the morning. Depending on how far we're going out, guests are usually fishing by around 10:30 in the morning. We float, fish, and camp that whole day. Do that for anywhere from two to 10 days. On the last day of the trip, we get picked up in the late afternoon by our air services and then get flown back to Anchorage. I encourage folks to stay in Anchorage that night. God forbid we get stuck, weathered out there for another day. That way folks aren't missing the flight and then they fly back to the lower 48 the following day. That's it. That's that perfect. So those are logistics to doing that. And that might be a, like a helicopter or a plane, depending on where you're going. So, and the trips you do, these are, these are trips where we're literally throwing Uh, inflating rafts, hopping in with all your gear and you're on the river, like you said, two to 10 days and you're just, you're floating the river and floating. What are you kind of floating fishing each day? Are you sticking in one spot and really hitting that spot hard and then moving to another spot? You know, we chase fish. So our goal is to get folks onto fish and if the fishing's good in one area, you know, don't leave fish to find fish, but ultimately with the float trip, you do got to float from A to B and you're correct. We do use inflatable rafts, uh, to get down cause it would be kind of hard to throw a drift boat into an airplane <laughs> and, the the rafts we use, um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. You know, some former outfitters would use old archaic gear that was heavy and clunky, And it's 2022. There's great manufacturers out there that make great boats that can roll up small, still be very comfortable so that folks have a good experience. Uh, Some of the other outfits that I used to guide for back in the day would make a 70-year-old person just sit on a tube of a boat. And I was like, man, we can do this better. So I custom fabricated all my frames myself. And we put uh, chairs with backrests on them. You know, all of our gear is modern and lightweight. So we're able to bring some creature comforts like beer. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't like beer when you're fishing? A lot of these other outfits wouldn't have folks bring beer. It's like, man, this is, you can do this better if you're not using a cooler that weighs 80 pounds. Yeah. You know, this is Alaska. We don't need a burly cooler that keeps ice cold for 20 days in 90 degree weather. You know, yeah. we're able to eat good food and keep food cold and healthy and safe, but still bring creature comforts like beer and yeah. chairs so that it's a comfortable experience for folks. There you go. This is good. So, so, and we'll dig more into the trip itself, the, the, you know, the camping, cause that's all part of it, obviously. I mean, that's a big part of it for me. I imagine just being out there under the stars, you know, seeing whatever wildlife it's, it's, I mean, that's why Alaska is what it is. But, um, let's talk about the fishing a little bit because somebody, you know, a lot of people, when they go up here, they're thinking, okay, I want to go to Alaska hundred percent, but when do I go? What species do I go for? And all that stuff. So I know there's different times, you know, some folks start in June through the summer into the fall. Let's take it to the fall. Let's say this was a a September trip. Um, Talk about that. What what would you, what species would you be hitting there in September? Yeah. So September is my personal favorite time to be up here chasing trout and silvers. Um, And in September, the colors are beautiful. We actually do see stars. You had mentioned seeing stars at night. Mm -hmm. Most of the time here in summer, like early summer, it doesn't get dark. We don't see stars. I don't even bring a headlamp till about mid-August because it doesn't doesn't get dark. Uh, But in September, you know, the days are still long. It's typically getting dark around 10 o'clock at night and the sun's up around 7 o'clock in the morning. So great time to be up here. Um, as far as the fishing is concerned, it is some of the best. You know, the trout are resident species, the leopard rainbow trout, Arctic grayling, Dolly Varden are super fat from eating all summer long. I mean, they're just mm. 
pigged out from eating salmon carcasses and flesh and mice all season long, but they're aware that winter is coming. So they're on one last feeding oh, rampage wow. to get as fat as they possibly can. And in the fall, you know, we're swinging flesh flies, we're swinging fl streamers. You can still get trout and dollies and grayling to eat mice patterns. Uh, it's really just my favorite time of year to be up here. Not that there's ever many people up here in Alaska, but there's far less in September. Oh, and the okay. fishing is just phenomenal. You got fall colors, crystal clear water. You know, anytime in Alaska, it can rain. Obviously, it's Alaska, but September is generally one of our not as rainy months. Generally, we did get snow mid-September last year, but it was still great, great fishing. Still great. No, that's amazing. So, and, and it just as we're on this slide with you know, the trip, I mean, so talk about the bugs. Are we uh, face masked <laughs> up with mesh bags over our heads or is this DEET or what are we doing here? You know, it's so funny, man. In the decade that I've been running trips up here, people always ask about two B words, bugs and bears. And bears. <laughs> And, you know, most of the time on the river corridor, there's enough moving air that haven't, you know, just kind of your basic long sleeve T-shirt or jacket and maybe a little bit of DEET and you're fine. Uh, but we do encourage folks to bring a head net because that two and ten times where it gets super still yeah. and there's no wind moving around, that head net is worth 20 times its yes. weight as gold because it yeah. does does help. But. You know, for the most part, like I said, on the river corridor, there's enough moving air that the bugs generally, quote, generally aren't that bad. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that's that's one of the things that I and yeah, the head net, definitely if you had to use it, it's not the yeah, it's not the end of the world. It's not that big of a deal. When I was up there a while back, uh, uh, we were up kind of north, more up out of Bethel. And there's I mean. I can't remember. I think it was actually the same time, but I think up there, there's probably a lot more ponds and water up there and more still yep. water. And it was definitely bad. Um, but it uh, sounds like it depends on where you go, right? A little bit Alaska and in the weather, right? Everything's going to be a little bit different depending yeah. on the region. Yep. It depends on where you go. I mean, we do a lot of trips uh, out of Bethel and there have definitely been some times out there. Yeah. Where they're, they're thick. You know, everyone jokes that the mosquito is our state bird, but it's not the mosquitoes that you need to worry about. It's the, the white socks, the noceums, yeah. those things no can definitely get you. But again, coming prepared, having a, a head net and, you know, appropriate clothing. It, doesn't you know when you're catching two foot long rainbows eating mouse patterns you're like oh this is fine this is worth it yeah exactly yeah I, I, no problem and then and you can have, of course you're camping right so you can have a, a campfire and get around the fire when you're up there yeah yeah we do it well we do have campfires you know we obviously adhere to you know state regulations when and where you're not supposed to have a fire but yeah we generally have fires on our trips and our camp scenes that we do again with having modern updated gear are pretty comfortable. I mean, it is still camping. Don't get me wrong, but you know, we bring uh, big kitchen tents that have bug netting and we have mosquito coils. We'll light a coil in the kitchen tent that takes care of it. It's got bug netting. Um, so you're eating dinner in a beautiful tent meshed down. So the bugs aren't in there looking at the river. And then we have separate sleeping tents for clients and we put folks up on cots and pads. Uh, wow. So you're not just sleeping on the ground. So you have, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is definitely a full on river trip. I mean, it's like a, a lodge on the move sort of thing. And you must have a, like a, a gear boat or two that's just bringing the gear down. Then you have guys that are on, how, how's that work? Like, let's just say you had a trip of say, you know, say five or six guys, what would that look like as far as boats? Yeah. So we fish two clients and one guide per boat. Um, on our longer trips, we fish 16 foot boats, which you can put a lot of gear into a 16 foot boat. And again, like I said, all of our gear is modern and updated. So it's very comfortable, lots of room. Uh, we do offer a couple variety of trips. We have our, our standard trips, which is basically, like I said, two clients per boat and a guide. Uh, but we do offer a uh, gear boat deluxe trips where there's a separate boat with a gear boatman that is one step ahead of the game. He's mm -hmm. ahead setting up lunch, setting up camp on those deluxe trips. We bring bigger tents that are like six foot four at the apex. So there's no kneeling or getting down. The cots that we use on those deluxe trips are at chair heights. So you're not bending down to get into a tent. Very comfortable and everything is set up for folks. And that's great for both the guests and the guides because, you know, when you're doing a standard trip and you're the guide, you're doing everything. Yes, you roll into where I we're know. doing lunch. We're busting out the grill. We're grilling burgers. We're grilling reindeer browns. Yep. The guide's got to break everything down. 
Whereas with the gear boat trip, the deluxe trip, you know, when you're the guide, you're just working with your clients, having fun, catching fish. You roll into the lunch spot, the grill's out, the hors d'oeuvres wow. are set, there's a cold beer <laughs> in your hand. Nice. And then, yo, it's great, man. Clients love it too. Our guests love it too. And then same thing when you go into camp for the end of the day, the gear boatman's already got the kitchen tent up. He's got appetizers prepped. He's got the tent set up for everyone. And you just do that. And then when you're the guide and then you're doing the gear boat, you know, you're just rolling ahead, rolling down the river by yourself, setting up camp, doing some fishing on your own. It's, it's great for everyone. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I, and I have... Back in the day, I, you know, I did a little bit of that river guiding and, and I was, you know, there's a period where I was doing the whole thing, you know, like you're saying, setting up camp, you know, guiding, doing the whole thing. And it, I'll tell you what, man, it is for those people who don't know, man, you're getting your pay because that's, that's not easy work. It's a full, it's a full on, um, it, you know, I think it's, you find the right person that loves it. You know, that's where you get like the, the wheelhouse, you know what I mean? It sounds like. Yep. Sounds like you're you're that person that, that loves these trips. So so let's let's keep on the fish. I want to do it because we talked about rainbows and all these. So when you look at September, are you already past say you know early September, mid September, getting past all the salmon, or is there any, any other salmon species out there at that time? Yeah, we got silver salmon present at that time, and they're one of the coolest salmonoid species to fish for. You know, runs up here in Alaska have been very fortunate so far for the most part is not having big declines like some parts of the lower 48 and even Canada for, for that matter. And silvers are absolutely prolific up here. They're my favorite salmon because they're so aggressive. They're big. You know, it's kind of funny to me being such a, I don't know, I'm trying to find the right words here, like when a salmon eats a fly or a lure for that matter. Uh, but let's just talk about fly fishing here. Like when a king hits a fly, when you're swinging a two handed rod, it's almost like a steelhead to me. Like they're curious. They're trying to figure out like, what right. is that? What is that thing? When a silver hits a fly, it's pissed. It's just anger. It's just like, ah, give me that thing. Right. And, uh, they're just so aggressive and their takes are so awesome. And one of my personal favorite ways to fish for silvers is, uh, on the top water, we fish poppers, you know, everyone talks wow. about polywogs, but just the bass, hard pink popper, you cast that out there and you plop that thing along the surface and you just see this massive wake barreling towards that thing. And in September, they're super thick in the rivers. I mean, you can, if you want to focus on silvers, you can catch as many that your shoulder can handle. It's great. There you go. So, so tons of silver. In that. And as you're putting in on these trips, I guess it depends on how long you're going, but are you starting up? say at the top and you're hitting more of the grayling and then slowly getting into rainbows and then finishing up with coho if it was if you're taking to that september period you know it kind of depends on what river you're talking about but most of the rivers that we focus on like don't get me wrong i love catching salmon but trout is where it's at so most of the rivers that we kind of tailor to are shorter as far as distance you know we're talking anywhere between on the short side 40 miles on the long side 60 miles yeah so the fishing is good for all species pretty much from start to finish you know some of the longer rivers that we do operate on you know over 100 miles up high it's like you said you know there'll be kind of more grayling dollies or char gotcha and then the rainbows pick up and then the silvers pick up but a lot of the rivers that we really try to focus on it's good from from start to finish and also you know if you're doing you know if, if you can do a 10-day trip and doing a 100 mile long river is great but if you're only up here and you're doing you know four to six days that's a lot of water to cover in yeah. a day so i found by you know finding rivers that have sections that we can land and get on whether it be by plane or helicopter and doing like a 40 mile float just allows a lot more time oh, right. to be you know standing on your own two feet working the little side braids and channels so you just spend more time fishing and less of a you know forced death march where we got to go from a to b we got 10 15 right. miles to cover today that's it whereas by doing shorter trips like i said earlier like fishing's good cool let's stay here yeah. and fish it's it's just a better flow in my opinion exactly no it makes total sense and i yeah we, i've been thinking about that again you know so you go in there say for a uh, like a four day trip or something like that if you had to cover say 30 miles or even 40 miles that's 10 miles a day versus covering 100 miles or something where you're literally just floating at most of the time so this is something exactly where, yeah so you're going in if it is a few day trip you're literally probably floating like maybe 10 miles a day something like that and you're getting yep. a ton of fishing in 
Yep, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like the main purpose of these trips, you know, is to experience Alaska and get out into the wild, but also catch fish. And if you're in a spot where the fishing's good, you're like, cool, let's stay here. Let's work this water. Let's fish. You know, it's just a better format for everyone. That's it. Okay. So basically, and like you said, depends on where you're going, species and stuff like that. For the most part, this is going to be definitely focused on in that period, September, the trout, these hungry trout, these other species. And then you might run into some coho, but obviously the schnook are gone. The, even like the sockeye, the pinks, these other species have all kind of tailed off by that time, right? Correct. Correct. You know, the kings, they're the first salmon to arrive in Alaska. And every once in a while, you'll see some zombie king hanging out. Uh, but for the most part, they're gone. The pinks generally are gone. Uh, so it's primarily the the rainbow trout, Arctic grayling, Dolly Varden, and then silver salmon in September. Okay, nice. So, well, let's talk a little bit. We had a couple. Uh, Chris uh, Cook had a question, um, and he was asking about just kind of rods, line, you know, gear sort of thing. So what? So somebody's coming up there. They're doing this trip. Let's keep it on September now. We're going to swing around to a little bit of maybe early season. But for now... September, what does that person need to bring up there for rods and, and lines? Yeah. Uh, so just a quick side note for Fish Hound. On our trips, we do provide all gear. You know, a lot of folks in the lower 48 are fishing four weights or five weights. Up here, we fish six and sevens for our trout. It just handles those fish more effectively because we love fighting these fish. We love playing these fish, but at the same time, we don't want to kill these fish. So having a stouter rod gets the job done quicker. You know, like I said, we're fishing primarily six or seven weights. Um, but the biggest thing that I found in the years, 20 years I've been guiding, especially in the last five to seven, is the innovations in fly line manufacturing and construction. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these newer lines out there, just with a heavier grain weight, allows flies to be turned over easier so on our trips we use really good line that makes it easier for folks but for someone coming up you're going to want to have a, a six or seven weight for our trout and then a, preferably a, a seven or eight for salmon uh, if that's what you want to focus on and you know we're like uh golf caddies out here when you're guiding you're like oh, okay tr trout fishing is great let's throw this mouse you're throwing the mouse on the mouse and then you run to a big school of silvers we put the six weight down hand you an eight weight and toss to the silvers with an eight Right. There you go. So that's it. So if you had two rods to bring, you might bring a six weight and an eight weight, nine yep. foot, six weight. Yeah. And then you're yep. covered. And then yep. lines just are using a, um, so that is a good question because there's a bunch of lines, right? I mean, you could, you know, obviously surface stuff you're talking about, but you could also grab some sinking lines. Do you want to have a mix of different types of, of sinking lines as well? Or what's that look like? No. So that's the great thing about most of the rivers that we fish, you know, sink tips. If you're just throwing a single head rod, you don't need a sink tip. If you need to get down a little bit deeper, we just throw in a piece or two of split shots. So you're not having to okay. have you know, different sink tips, just a basic, um, well, not a basic, but a weight forward floating line. But like I said, there's a couple of manufacturers out there now that are making great lines that throw heavy flies very easily you know you're not having to false cast back and forth 20 times to get the line out just pick up once fire that big heavy fly out there and splash it on the water up here we're not throwing you know like 18 or 22 midges so you don't need delicate line presentation our fish don't care i mean for the most part we're fishing uh 10 to 12 pound monofilament leader material you know we're not throwing 5x or 6x Exactly. These are essentially, these are like... Our fish aren't leader shy. <laughs> no, no. These are essentially kind of like fishing for steelhead or something like that. These are big... Very similar. Yep. Big rainbows and uh, nice. So so basically dry line, you got your six weight, at seven weight out there and your And typically, I guess there's different ways, like you mentioned, whether you're swinging mice or something like that. But, but talk about that a little bit. So if you were swinging, um, is that kind of what you're doing, say half the time? Or what, how else would you be swinging? Just like you said, flesh flies as well? Swinging flesh flies as well. You know, in September, we're swinging a lot of big streamers. You know, Dalai Lama is kind of the new go-to fly that can catch everything very well. Mm. And you'll just be kind of just like swinging for steelhead, kind of casting quarter downriver, letting that fly swing through. And then how I prefer to fish is you cast that fly out, you let it swing through once. Because there are sometimes days where fish want that slower, just casual swing. And then other days, you know, that fish the fish want that fly moving. So you fish it like a streamer down in the lower 48, banging the banks, twitching that rod tip, stripping the line in. And when I'm working a run, when I'm doing that method, I'll let run run swing through nice and natural. Next presentation, just rip that fly through the water because some days they want that fly moving. Mm. Other days they just want it casually swung. So doing both in the same drift kind of lets you figure out what they're doing. Gotcha. And then as far as the 
the mouse is concerned in September, you know, early season is generally when people talk about mouse fishing. But mm -hmm. up here, a trout will almost always hit a mouse and it just, you may have to work for it a little bit more. And, um, you know, you know, it's kind of like in the lower 48, would you rather catch two on the surface or five yeah. subsurface? The same right. principles apply up here. Would you yeah. rather catch 10 subsurface or would you rather catch three on the surface? Yeah. And most folks, once they three. see that trout, just <laughs> annihilate that mouse, yeah. like, why would I want to do anything else? That was awesome. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. So three on the surface is, is money. And and when you're doing that, so, and how big, like how far are you casting typically? Are these pretty small streams that we're fishing? Yeah, they're small to medium-sized rivers. You know, in Alaska, we do have huge rivers, obviously, that everyone has seen. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the rivers that we tend to operate on are, you know, smaller to medium-sized rivers. So a far cast is, you know, 20, 25 feet. They're pretty user-friendly rivers. And too, when you're in a boat, if there's a fish on that bank, you just move the boat a little closer to that make bank, make it easier. There you go. So, so yeah, and you have boats and you're cruising down and, and so we got a little bit of a, a taste of this. So we're in September and let's go back to the start. So we drop us off. Uh, you said the first morning you get out there, you're literally fishing. You got the boats all rigged. You're floating down and you're pretty much fishing all day until like you said, it gets dark at 10 PM. Is that kind of how it is? Or are you coming into camp before that? You know, we play each trip to our guests and what they want. You know, we get some folks who like to stay up a little bit later drinking beer and bourbon around the fire. And then we also get folks who like to get up a little bit earlier. So we tend to play within reason to our, our guests' expectations and what they're looking. But on a typical trip, you know, we're typically up around 8 o'clock in the morning doing coffee, doing good breakfast like blueberry pancakes, cinnamon raisin French toast. For the folks who are mm -hmm. super gung-ho, they can wake up, grab their coffee, start fishing. Um, just a little side tangent here and all the years I've been doing this, I found like the first couple days, people are like up right away, catching fish, catching fish. And then when we come into camp in the evening, they're catching fish, catching fish, catching fish. And then typically by like day three or four, they're like, okay, I've caught a million fish. Let's <laughs> slow down here. I'm going to enjoy it a little bit. I'm going right. to you know, get up, have breakfast, get on the water, fish, come into camp, eat dinner, maybe catch a fish or two after dinner and then sit by the campfire with my friends and the guides. Um, but on a typical trip, like I said, yeah, we're typically up guides are up before clients getting everything going, do breakfast, pack everything up, float down. We typically do lunch around two ish. You know, we're doing hot lunches like bacon, cheeseburgers, reindeer brats, mm. roll into camp typically around five thirty ish guides, get everything set up. Clients, you know, are typically still doing a little fishing, cook dinner and then everyone's around the campfire and this is when the guides go fish generally they get everyone set and happy and then the guides will typically be the ones out fish until 12 o'clock at night we oh, definitely yeah. do get guests who will come with the clients and some of the uh sorry get guests who will come with the guides and go fishing and that honestly you know being a guide has been some of the funnest experience with clients when they come fishing with us and they see us work the water and then we work with them a little bit more and we're all just hanging out, you know, typically drinking beer or bourbon and mm -hmm. just having a blast in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. That's right. That's right. And, and, and are there, are there a few, let's go onto that bear, the, the other bee. Are there a few, are you seeing bears out there in some of these areas? We do see bears. Yeah. 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 You know, um, it's Alaska. Their brown bears are, are very prevalent, but for the most part, on the rivers that we operate on, we do see bears, but bears are also hunted in a lot of these areas that we operate. And brown bears particularly are extremely smart. They remember the, you know, the sows teach their cubs things. And they generally don't associate us with anything good. Um, so generally once they get a whiff of us or they see us, they typically hightail it out. Um, you know, bears are a big animal. They're always to be respected. Um, but they generally don't associate us with good things. So they typically are making their way away from us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So they're out of there unless you left your food laying around or something like that or made it real easy for them. You know, it's I mean, you definitely want to be safe and practice good camping principles. Uh, but when I first moved up here, I'll, I'll never forget. You know, I'm from Colorado, bow hunter most of my adult life, heavy respect for, for bears and leaving food out. And I'll never forget. I was on the side of the river. We're cooking bacon and there's just 
bacon grease and the smell of bacon in the air. And this big boar just comes walking down this back channel right towards us. And I'm like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. I'm standing by bacon. There's a cooler right <laughs> there. That bear just picks up a piece of dead salmon, crunches on it, and walks the opposite way. Like right. brown bears have such a good, reliable food source, being the yep. salmon, that they really don't want to, you know, eat our food. That's a very unique thing about Alaska is the bears, the brown bears, interior bears, different story. Like when I've been up hunting in the interior, we don't even sleep where we eat because there isn't that substantial right. food source. Whereas yeah, on the yeah. rivers that we operate on, there's food for the bears everywhere and they really don't want anything to, to do with us. Yeah. Yeah. That's really the big difference. I think Alaska, yeah, there, there's so much food up there and and it's just not an issue for them to get food. And so over the years in Alaska, have you had any like encounters that were kind of, you know, kind of puckered you up a little <laughs> bit or you're like close at all? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, you know, I've been guiding up here for a very long time. I definitely have had a couple of close encounters. Um, there's only ever one real encounter where I thought my number was up. Yep. And, you know, I used to snowboard professionally, still do a lot of backcountry experiences up here on a board and snow machines. And I never in my life had an out of body experience or thought I was actually going to die doing what I was doing with right. this one exception. And uh, I was out fishing by myself, you know, at the end of the day after getting clients down. And I normally always have my gun on me and I'm normally always very loud singing just, you know, making my presence known. And I was walking down river, mousing, the wind was blowing up river. My buddy was probably about 200 yards behind me and was just being quiet, mousing, enjoying Alaska. And I come around this corner and this huge boar, uh, boar's a, a male bear, just mm. stands up and he looks at me and I look at him and all of a sudden I am above myself looking down at myself and everything in this real time experience has already gone and happened in a blink of an eye. And I'm looking down at myself and that bear lunges at me. Oh, wow. And on that first splash of him coming at me, like water actually hit me in the face. Oh, and I was like, well, dude, you did everything wrong. You forgot your gun. You weren't being Damn. loud. You weren't singing. You weren't throwing rocks. Like, you're going to turn into a statistic. Like, what do you do? Huh? What do you do? And I was like, well, you do what you tell your clients to do if you ever find yourself in this horrible, easily avoidable situation. And that was just sound off like you got the biggest pair in the world and you're yeah. the baddest thing that walks that river. And at the, as that water hit me in the face, my buddy's looking down river and he just sees me just hawk out, wolverine out. And I just yelled and I smacked that bear with the tip of my fly rod. And on that second lunge, he darted to the right of me. Oh, wow. And he comes running down. He's like, dude. And I was so freaked out. The only thing I could do was just go back to, to fishing. Huh. I'm just skating my mouse. And he's like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> and he's standing right there. He's like patting my back. And all of a sudden, like everything just hit me. And bleh, just puked in the Oh, wow. <laughs> No it kidding. Just all, I mean, it was literally so close, but all I could do was just go back to fishing to try to get over it. So you hit him. You literally, you, you yelled at him like a, a wolverine yell and, and smacked him, literally smacked him with your fly rod. Yep. Wow. Yep. Don't recommend that approach. <laughs> That's right. Wow. That is, that is intense. So, so there you go. Obviously you're going to have some of those, you know, I mean, you do it for a career. Um, you know, th those are bound to happen, but for the most part, you know, you're out there that that's not a uh, common occurrence. Yeah. Yeah. That is definitely not the common, you know, like, I mean, that particular season I guided in the back country 95 days, I think. No, no, 92 days. My wife said yeah. she was very good at counting how yeah. many days I was out that year. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, yeah. so, but that's a good tip. You know, there's your bit you know, for the person that has the bear question. I mean, literally even in the places where you're, it's really crazy, um, you know, just be loud and make sure you don't surprise them. Right. That's the worst thing you can do is surprise them. Yep. Just be loud. You know, where we do our steelhead trips, uh, on Kodiak Island, you know, the river that we got out out there is, is furry. 
I mean, you are seeing a ton of bears. I mean, it's just a part of it. And just being loud, you know, we carry, obviously the guides carry firearms for safety and we give uh, bear spray to clients, but an air horn, you know, you're mm. just walking down fish and you just hit, brrr, hit that air horn and yeah. it just makes presence known. You know, that's really the most yeah. important thing. And, you know, particularly on Kodiak, you know, those bears are used to seeing humans because there's a lot of bear viewing out there. But again, they're also hunted. So they generally don't associate us with anything good. So just making your presence known is really the biggest thing. And like the misfortunate story that I told you, had I been doing what I was supposed to be, being loud, making my presence known, it would have not been an issue. Yeah, it wouldn't have been an issue. No, that's that's pretty pretty crazy. So, okay, so there's there's a good bear story for us. And uh, taking it back to the trip again, obviously this is all part of it. But um, you know, just understanding what to expect from Alaska. That's kind of what we're digging in here into here and. You know, in September, we, we've got this trip where we're floating down. We're really focused on, you know, trout. If you take it through, you know, maybe swing it through the winter and into the next season, when are you starting, like, your trips? If you go back to, like, the spring or summer on the other end. Yeah. Yeah. So we start doing uh, our day trips, uh, which are up in the Matsu Valley. We have oh, about half a dozen eight rivers that we fish up there. And we start commercially operating mid-May. And we're fishing for trout, we're fishing for grayling, we're hitting that smolt migration as the salmon smolt are running out, which is awesome. Early season is also one of the few times where having bug knowledge from the lower 48 can be good because there's a small Mm -hmm. window there where there's not that much food present. And so some of our fish will eat bugs early season. Um, And so we start mid-May and then once June hits, you know, things are starting to get rolling. And then we start doing our our multi-day flyouts uh, mid-June and we run those all the way through September. And then October, we move to Kodiak Island and run steelhead trips on Kodiak Island in October. Oh, wow. There you go. So yeah, you're hitting, so you're spreading out all throughout, you know, Alaska and then over to Kodiak and Yep. You got, and then you wrap up the season, what, by uh, kind of like November? Uh, we're done typically end of October. And then we actually, uh, our company, we guide ice fishing from November through April. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah. You gotcha. So you got a full, yeah, you're, you're a full, this is a, not a, a six month season. You're doing a full thing. No, it's, it's pretty much year round. You know, there are some times like in April or November where the rivers are choked up with ice and the lakes aren't thick enough to get out on where we're not running trips. But for the most part, we're, we're getting folks out fishing year round. Year round. And what is the biggest thing when you just, again, look at, you know, from like the start, we talked about Colorado versus Alaska. You've lived now, how long have you been in Alaska? 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. So you've been there a nice chunk of time. Yep. What is the biggest difference for somebody who's just talking about living up there, Alaska versus say Colorado? What, what, what is the biggest thing for you that kind of, you know, that you think of? Oh man. Uh, it's just everything. Alaska's better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love people. I love being around folks. I love showing people the wonderful things that we're able to do, but I don't like a lot of people. And Mm. that's what brought me up to Alaska. I mean, in our entire state, the largest state in the union, there's 700,000 people. Oh, wow. In Denver alone, there's like close to 2 million people for right, sure right. by now, even yeah. probably more now as we're saying this. So Alaska yeah. to me is just, there's more spaces. It's remote. It's bigger. The fishing up here, obviously it's Alaska is, is next level. I mean, you know, you talk to people about bucket list trips for freshwater fishing. Alaska is generally at the top yeah. of most of those people's lists as, as it should be. It's just amazing yeah. up here. Uh, But then past that, living up here, um, more fish, less people, more snow. I mean, right now, um, our little ski resort, we're sitting at over 630 inches of snow. My first year I moved up here, it snowed over 1,000 inches. Jeez. It's just awesome. So this is good. So you got good snowboarding, too, up there. It's good powder. Oh, yeah. Yep, good powder. Very much so. Good (laughs) (laughs) powder. Nice. This is good. Okay. So tell me that I want to dig it because obviously if somebody wants a done for you trip, I mean, a remote rafting experience, like we've talked about, this is, I mean, you've obviously got this dialed. What if somebody wanted to go up there and they put together, say more of a DIY thing where they're, they're interested in going, maybe they're, I mean, that's probably a very small percentage of people, but if they want to do that, where does somebody start with that sort of thing? Is that just like a huge, a huge thing to get into? Uh, I mean, it must be just think about getting your raft right to a location. Yeah. What, what yeah. would be your advice there? 
you know, trying to do a DIY trip, if or are you talking like more doing like a remote flyout trip or like road accessed type fishing? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would, yeah, that is, that's too. So I guess, I guess if you did say remote flyout, obviously you got to add, you know, connecting with somebody who can do that for you and all that stuff. And do you, do you do that? If somebody came up and said, Hey, we want to get the gear and stuff like that. Would you do that? Or is that some other surface? That would be another service. All of, yeah. all of the operations that we do are, are are all guided. Yeah, are all guided. So basically, yep. let, let's just take it to it. Let's just make it easier. Say somebody's doing a road trip up to Anchorage with, with the family. They're going to be cruising around Anchorage. Are there any places there where you can kind of get out and have an experience? Um, or what would you recommend? Oh, definitely. Definitely. You know, Alaska's road system is definitely not as complex as, you know, like, say, Colorado, where there's all these old mining roads and lumber roads that you can four wheel on or hike up on or bike on to get access. You know, we don't really have that much up here, which is good. It keeps Mm -hmm. our areas pristine. Uh, But on the road system, if folks are coming up with their family doing the general tourist thing, there's tons of road access fishing. I mean, obviously, with the amount of rivers that we have in Alaska, I mean, like where we're located uh, north on the Parks Highway, when you're driving up north going towards Denali or Fairbanks, you're going to cross over countless river systems and you could park on the side of the road, hike up, hike down. You know, there's a lot of road access fishing. And we do have a lot of folks who come up and, you know, myself and my guides and most people are pretty willing to share information because there is so much good fishing up here. But just the most advice, the Biggest piece of advice I could give to folks coming up here to do that, you know, if you are from like the Rocky Mountains and all you know is bugs, you know, maybe do a half day guided trip so you can Mm. see how you fish a bead rig um, so that that is known or, you know, what type of streamers we use. Because up here in Alaska, it's all single hook. Well, for the most part, it's one fly, single hook. And obviously we encourage barbless being guides. Uh, but it's just a little different in that regard. And I can't tell you how many times I've been out on our road access trips, float by a group of guys, you know, they're dressed the part, they got good cast, they're doing it right. And I got some clients who've never fly fished before and yep. we're crushing it. When we get to the boat ramp and guys are coming out, I'm like, hey, how'd you guys do today? They're like, man, we didn't catch anything or we caught one fish. Right. It's like, right. well, what are you fishing? And I look at their rigs. I'm like, yeah, right. you're going to need to change this up a little bit. So that would be my biggest advice either by doing a half day guided trip or just doing your own research. You know, there's obviously YouTube internet, you know, find out what a bead rig is, find out what salmon smolt are, find out what a lamprey is, just the things that our fish actually eat up here. So that when you're out there, you have a good, you know, foundation of what to do, when to do and how to do it. Yep. That's right. So, yeah, there's tons of resources. And then are there, I mean, are there some fly shops? Like if somebody was going to a region, say they're going into, you know, yes. somewhere. Yeah, there are. Yes, definitely. So in Anchorage, there's Mossy's Fly Shop. Uh, Mike Brown is the owner. Great guys. Him and Brian, they do a great job. They're very giving of their information. Mossy's is awesome. And then up in the Matsu Valley, Three Rivers is awesome. AJ is a great dude. Um, Mm -hmm. so there are, there are fly shops up here and they do have great gear and great information and they're very willing to help that out, uh, to help give that out. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's perfect. And I'll put some of those links in the show notes because yeah, that's a good thing. If somebody is doing something up there, they can't do their, you know, they can't go on a trip with you maybe right, right away or something like that. Then we'll, we'll send them out to some other places. And uh, I mean, do you know, when you look at Alaska, I mean, obviously it's humongous, but do you kind of know all the players up there? All the lo- or are there just so many like hundreds and hundreds of lodges now? You you have no idea about who all these people are. No, Alaska is a pretty small knit community. I mean, it is big. There are lots of outfitters and lots of lodges, um, but there's pretty much maybe two degrees of separation from one to another. Um, now, if we're talking regions, like there's South Central which is kind of the the mainland, but then you also got Southeast Alaska, which is like a whole different world all to itself. And then you have Mm -hmm. Bristol Bay, which is a whole different world all to itself. Then you have Western Alaska, which can be a whole different world all to itself. And then you got the stuff up North in the Arctic. So there definitely is some degrees of separation between the two. Um, You know, Southeast is definitely a different world down there versus our area. And then Western Alaska, where we also operate is also a different world. And then up north too. So there are up north. Yeah. 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 
That's right. And are you covering, when you fly out from Anchorage, are you kind of covering, uh, it sounds like you're going up north a bit too. Are you kind of all over the place? Yeah. So for most of our shorter flyout trips, we operate out of South Central, uh, which is in the greater Anchorage area up north to Talkeetna, which is about a two hour drive north of Anchorage. And then our stuff in Western Alaska, we have a base in Bethel and we fly out of Bethel. And then for our steelhead stuff, we operate out of Kodiak. We do that there. And then next year, this coming season, I'm super pumped. Uh, found a very good pilot who does a lot of hunting up there. But we're moving mm. operations to start chasing uh, big she fish and the big sea oh, wow. run Arctic char way up there on the on the north slope. And where, now, where is that? That's way up north on the on the mainland. Way north. Way. Oh north. wow. <laughs> no kidding. So way up past uh, north of Fairbanks and all that. North of Fairbanks. Yep. Oh yeah, man. Way north. Of Fairbanks. Man, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you're slowly, sounds like you're slowly adding some, um, some products, I guess, essentially to your, what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I got into this business cause it was my dream since I was 14 years old to own a guide service in Alaska. And as we talked earlier, you know, everyone focuses on these rivers that are known or these regions that are known, yeah. but there's so much still up here that folks don't focus on. And if you're looking for an experience that isn't a stationary lodge where you come back to at five o'clock and you get in a hot tub, if you're willing to get out and fly, there's so much out there that is still either under the radar or not utilized for fishing. There's so much water up here in so many places. Yeah. That's great. That's, that's the key. And, and then, and experiencing it with a remote, yeah, remote trip like you do is, is a good way to, is a good way to do it. So what, what is the, on the fish again? So we talked about a little bit of the fall, a little bit of the early, if, if folks were going into July, August, is there a time where, when would be the time where you could catch the most, do you guys ever focus where it's like, okay, we're going for sockeye and pinks and kind of everything oh, yeah. or is you, yeah, you do it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know, we definitely, so when we're, when folks reach out, they either have an idea of what they want to do or they have no idea because all the information that you can find on Alaska, let's face it, can be overwhelming with the yeah, amount of definitely. fish and rivers up here. And we do get guests who are like, man, I want to catch a lot of everything. Perfect. The window you want to shoot for then is late July, early August. That's when you have all of our resident species present, uh, rainbow trout, Arctic grayling, Dolly Varden slash Arctic char. But then at that time frame, you'll have all five species of Pacific salmon present in one stage or another. Now, granted, some of the salmon might be a little zombied out, but they're still there. You know, um, kings will still be present. Sockeye will be present. Pinks will be present. Chums will be present. And then silvers are starting to arrive. That's it. So middle of the and, summer. And, uh, yep. Yeah, that's a great window to be up here. I mean, you can catch, you know, nine to ten different species on one fly. It's awesome. That's perfect. Yeah. And if they want more information from what you have, probably the best thing would be to head out to, I think you have a form on your website if they want to get some more info on what you have going and you can kind of just talk to them on a, on a call, right? And guide them through. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. As much as we've grown and all the guides and boats and locations we have, um, it's still me who does all the booking. I love it. I love talking to folks, you know, getting them, getting them pumped and making sure they're getting the trip that they want. Because if folks are wanting a lodge experience, I know lodge owners more than happy to refer them to. But for folks wanting to get more of a remote float, making sure we're the right fit and getting them into the time of year and river and location that fits their expectations. That's it. That's awesome. Yeah. No, this has been good. I think uh, we've got a, a good feel for it. And like I said, we can't dig into it all, but at least it gives us a start uh, of something. And, you know... I mean, when you look at what we talked about today, what, what did we miss here, Adam? Anything you want to throw out here just to kind of highlight anything else that uh, we, we didn't dig fully into on what you offer? Uh, no, I think we did a pretty good job. The only thing we really didn't cover is my first and foremost, my biggest addiction, and that's steelhead. Oh, yeah, yeah no. I, <laughs> let, let's go to that because I, when, you mentioned, uh, when you mentioned Kodiak, I wanted to touch on that. So let, let's let's take that just for a little bit because obviously we have a lot of steelheaders in here. So. So is Kodiak, I mean, obviously you have Southeast and stuff, but yep. um, my dad, I remember back in the day, used to do these trips up to Kodiak a long time ago when I was a little kid, and I never went up there, and I always remember seeing the pictures and stuff. But but give us that. How, how different is the Kodiak thing versus, say, uh, going for other species up there? 
Um, you know, steelhead, you know, just like down on the lower 48, they can be a little bit more sparse, but that's really not the case. Uh, well, generally not the case up here where we operate, you know, Southeast and then, uh, the river in particular that we operate on is called the Carluck. It has one of the largest returns of steelhead in the state. And, you know, I, I grew learned to steelhead, didn't grow up, but learned to steelhead on, in Oregon down in your neck of the woods on the Deschutes. Where oh, if yeah. you if you caught you know one steelhead a day swinging you were a badass yeah you know up here on a slow day if you're swinging a slow day is five to six an average day is eight to ten a good day is fifteen plus oh wow and you know our steelhead runs up here are still strong they're still doing good the best thing with Kodiak is the native corporation manages that river so they control permits for people getting on there they just do a very great job of managing that fishery so we still have high numbers and it's a shorter river i mean the whole river itself is 24 miles long from where it starts in the lake to where it dumps out into the ocean gotcha. so in such a short strain of river i mean our average return is around six thousand fish right so you got that many fish and you know, basically 22 to 24 miles of river. It's just, just phenomenal. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. And they're in there. Uh, so you're hitting them. So for the steelhead, what, what is the, what's the best time to be targeting them? Um, for this particular river, it's the fall. It is a fall run river only. So fish come in in the fall and then they overwinter over and then they spawn in the spring and then return out to the ocean where some rivers in Alaska, just like the lower 48 will have fall runs, spring runs, winter runs. Uh, the Carlick in particular is just a fall run fishery. A fall run. So you're hitting them. So could you go out there and say, yeah, like summertime, like August and, and find fish there? Uh, not steelhead. You know, the earliest we've seen steelhead out there is, is mid September. Uh, but the heat of the run is primarily in October. Oh, in October. So October. Yep. So basically it's a, it's a pretty short little window to get in there before the winter kind of hits. Is that kind of how yep. that looks? Yeah. Yep. Very much so. Yep. Perfect. Nice. And, and normal, normal tactics, obviously we've got bunches of uh, tons of episodes on steelhead, but is it kind of normal, just swing oh, yeah. dry line and all that stuff? Yep. And yep. Yep. Swinging flies, you know, preferred method to do it, but obviously just like any fish in Alaska, they'll hit an egg. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, we've had that. I've caught, I, I joke about it sometimes because, you know, there's this whole, I've had people in the Midwest talk about, you know, the, the struggle there because you've got all these different techniques, but man, I've caught so many fish on the, the glow bug over the over the my years you know what i mean on yeah. tons of steelhead on the globe so i'm i know the effectiveness and that obviously you can catch a lot more steelhead nipping um in the right conditions 100 yep. percent. yep yep definitely that's one thing as a fisherman i'll swing through these runs and you know home tide fly polar bear hair just beautiful fly swing through nothing nothing then you throw a 12 millimeter piece of plastic and they're like ah son of a bitch. there you go i know it is what it, it is, is the bees work. We just did an episode a while back. Well, I guess it was a little while back on the Umqua a story of Umqua feather merchants with Russ yep. Miller. And he talked about the, uh, the gold bead, like literally in the mid nineties, there were no beads. And then this one guy from in Europe came over and he's like, Hey, you know, check out these gold beads. And and of course now look at the beads out there, right? They got pinks and they got every color you can imagine. They, they all work, right? Certain situations. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um, I mean, I remember at a fly fishing show I went back to in Denver many, 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 many years ago, like, uh, these guys were passing out these beads. I was like, what the heck a bead? What the hell? And now it's just a, a staple in fishing, you know, pretty much uh, across the world. And now these bead manufacturers, I mean, we, when we first started, we would have to go to the craft stores, get the just basic craft beads and paint them ourselves with nail polish. And now bead manufacturers, there's so many niche bead manufacturers. They're making soft beads, painted beads. You don't even have to do that anymore. Yeah. You name it. You name it. That's cool. So, so Kodiak yeah, and again for Kodiak, if they want to check in more, we'll send them out to again, to either call you or sign up on that form. If they want to get some more information on what you have going. So just a couple more here, uh, Adam, before we get out of here. And these, again, a couple more questions from the uh, from the Facebook group. One was on kind of weather emergency safety, right? So people are out here, they're planning on doing this remote trip with you, or maybe they're setting up their own trip. What sort of safety things is it just like the EPIRB or what do you, what do you have out there when you're, when you're doing this? So we have uh, satellite phones, um, 
you know, that's a great thing to have. And then also uh, aircraft radio is another good thing to have. But uh, a good satellite phone in working order, all of our trips have those. And then, like I said, also uh, air radio, VHF air radio is a good thing to have. Air radio. Okay. So, so if something happens crazy, whatever that is, somebody gets injured, you could literally just call up and fly in a helicopter and grab them out of there. Basically, I mean, <laughs> yeah, something like that. It may not, it may not happen that quick, uh, depending yeah. <laughs> on where you're at. Uh, but the biggest yeah. thing for folks coming up here is just be prepared. Do your due diligence, whether it be hiring a guide or doing it on your own, but having redundancy in your gear. You know, if you're out there doing a remote trip, and uh, we've had it happen on one of our trips where a bear actually stood on the raft and bears have massive claws and just shredded the raft. Oh, wow. So having an appropriate repair kit for your boat, for your waders, just All everything right. backed up, Backups. double, triple redundancy, you know. That's right. So do you recommend people come up there with um, just a good patch kit or do people, are they bring in literally like an extra pair of waders and st- extra rain jacket, stuff like that? An extra rain jacket is a good thing to have unless you have a very good rain jacket that you've used before. And I'm talking like a Northwest United States style rain jacket, yeah. not Colorado where it rains for 20 minutes and then yeah. sun comes out again. But, you know, a good heavy duty rain jacket made by a good man. Like rubber or Gore-Tex? Good Gore-Tex. You know, yeah. the new Gore-Tex Pro out there that multiple manufacturers use is phenomenal. Um You know, bring in an extra set of waders, depending on how long you're going to be gone for, maybe not necessary as, again, when you're doing these fly-out trips, whether you're doing it with a guide or DIY where you hire an air service, space is limited. It's not like river trips in the lower 48 where you can throw everything in the back of your truck, bring extras and throw it in. Like, even in a big plane like a beaver, space and weight is a thing. So you got to pick and choose what you bring very carefully. So having appropriate patch kits with enough material and enough glue slash aqua seal would be better as opposed to bringing a whole nother set of waders. Or if you're going with a group, bring one extra set of waders just in case. Extra set of waders. Yeah, and that was one definitely one of the questions that I had preparing for this is uh, somebody was asking about clothing and stuff. So maybe may we just do a quick little snippet on that because, again, for somebody who's new that doesn't know, um, you know, are we bringing, so, like, what, uh, some long johns, some really heavy, warm stuff? Like, what is, are the nights out there just, are you sitting out there in a T-shirt or are you wearing, like, a hoodie and, and strapped down? <laughs> <laughs> you're you're probably not wearing a T-shirt. Let's take to September again. So we're, yeah. we're mid-September. Are we, is there a potential that things are going to get a little chilly? You know, September, like I said, is one of my favorite times to be up here because generally it's, Indian summer, where it's not as rainy as August, uh, but it does get cool in the evenings. But on the cold side, we're talking, you know, mid 40s in the evenings. You know, we definitely do have some nights where we'll get some frost on the tent. So it does drop below freezing. So just yep. come in prepared, you know, a micro yeah. puff. You know, you don't yep. want to wear, obviously, most people who listen to your podcast know cotton kills. So you want to try to yep. obviously avoid cotton. Uh, but just having a good insulating layer and then obviously a good rain jacket will, will keep you pretty comfortable. And go. as far as sleeping bags, you know, a 30 degree bag is pretty appropriate. You know, if someone is a little colder and sleeps colder, having a, a warmer bag. But for the most part, a 30 degree bag is, is more than appropriate. That's it. So basically, yeah. So bring your normal, uh, uh, you know, if it was me, I'd be bringing my normal, you know, kind of long johns, bottom layer, you know, all the fleece. And then I'd have yep. an extra, extra layer just in case I got stuff wet, just always have a backup. Exactly. And then that's pretty much it. And then you got a couple jackets, you got your, and then you got, maybe if you want to bring your own rod, you got that, you got your waders. And, um, and then other than that, it's pretty, you know, you, you guys, you guys cover it all. Everything else you guys cover. Yep. Yep. Exactly. We make, try to make it as easy for folks as possible. What about uh, what about a fishing license? When do they pick that up? Um, so you want to get that ahead of time. Um, Alaska just switched a couple years ago to a complete uh, online, online system. Perfect. And yeah. sadly, as we all know, computers are fallible. And there have been several days in the last couple of years where the system crashes for whatever sure. reason. Yep. So the minute you know you're coming to Alaska, go online, yeah. get your license, you pick it for the dates that you want to, you can actually pick it for the times when it starts and when it ends. So just get that ahead of time. Uh, they just switched regulations to where you don't need the actual paper printed copy, which used to be silly. Now you can just have a digital copy on your phone, or if you are going out to an area where your phone might die, or you're not bringing your phone, just have a paper copy and you're good to go. Get it ahead of time, print it out, 
That way you got it. So God forbid if you get here the day before your trip and the system fails, you got it covered. You got to cover. That's awesome. And, and, uh, well, let's take it out of here. We're, we're going to do this segment, uh, called ask a pro and we're, these will be coming up later on after this episode, but let's just test this out here. And we're going to start off. We've already asked a, a number of questions from folks out there who are going to be listening to this episode, but, um, let's go back to the two twenty two, which is kind of top two tips, flies and resources, which was a segment we've done quite a number of times on this, on the show. But so talk about that. So again, we're, we're, we're flies. Let's bring us to kind of that September, mid-September timeframe. What are two flies that I, I should have be tying up and have in my box? Uh, any variation of a fly called the Dalai Lama. It's a uh, it's super basic fly, imitates everything, can be swung, can be stripped, can be dead drifted. Uh, but definitely the Dalai Lama, whether it be black and white, olive and white, black and green, whatever, definitely yep. that fly. And then, sadly, uh, the other fly would be a piece of plastic, a bead. Oh, it would. So you, so definitely, you, we're beads are a key on this. There yeah. Might be a time, it, yeah. If we're if we're talking for numbers and yep. catching fish and being efficient in September, yes, would be a Dalai Lama and a bead. Now, I would recommend having three and bringing some mouse flies because watching yeah a trout hammer a mouse is awesome. But yeah. But if we're talking just pure efficacy for catching fish, it would be a Dalai Lama and a bead. Okay, Dalai Lama, bead, and then we'll also have, yeah, the, the mouse in there. Okay, so we got those three. And then, so, and back on the river. So we're, we're coming down. It's like, you know, day one, day two, and we get into a pot of rainbows. What, what, are, you, what are you telling somebody who's, say, on your boat and they're maybe— Maybe they're uh, not the greatest, you know, caster in the world, but they're, you know, struggling a little bit. What do you tell them to help them get into some some nice fish there? A couple of tips. Hold on. Really? <laughs> Just hold on. Keep that tension. And yeah, they're they're going to get that fish. So it's not yeah. it's not an issue of like doing. I mean, literally, you're splashing it out there. Whatever you need to do, just get in the yeah. water. Just and get swing. in the water. And are you swinging? Yeah. Are you always casting downstream and across? Uh all of the above, you know, for drifting from the boat, you want to be casting ahead of the boat, letting that fly swing out. Uh, but same time, if the guide's really hard on the sticks back row and you're going to be casting parallel oh, to the right. boat and either stripping it across or just letting it swing through. But, you know, generally right. with our fish, just get it in the water, leave it yeah. in the water, let that fly fish and then set that hook hard. <laughs> gotcha. So a lot of this is like you're floating down, you're in the boat fishing from the boat. How much of that is the fishing in the boat versus, say, the fishing, uh, you know, walking and waiting during the trip? Uh, pretty equally of both. I mean, as we've talked earlier, obviously on a float trip, you do got to go float from A to B. But with yeah. most of our rivers being shorter, like if we do find this hypothetical pot of rainbows where they're super thick, we're pulling the boat over. We're standing on our own two feet, working in it that way. Or if it's in an area that you can't fish easily from the bank, that we'll do laps. We'll fish it. Guy will get into a back eddy, row back up. We'll float back over, work it again, and we'll just wash, rinse, and repeat. I mean, we, we do that a lot. And in some of our areas um, where it is a little bit bigger of a river and you can't really work it that effectively from your own two feet, uh, we row over, God, most of my guys row close to 2,000 miles a summer. So they're pretty strong. They'll just row back up and down, back up and down, and just keep hitting those fish, catching as many as we can. There you go. So, and, and are people in there, I mean, I, I know there's some people with the spay, would a trout spay or any of that be cool to have out there just to, if you're really into that? Definitely. Yes, definitely. We, myself and my guides and clients, guests as well, the two-handed approach is awesome, whether it be a switch rod or a traditional spay, uh, but super, super fun, effective way to catch fish up here, whether that be traditionally swinging or doing the, you know, the huck and duck with a bobber, a.k.a. strike indicator, yep. you know, um, great way to fish the two handed rods. And especially up here, you know, obviously Alaska, lots of bushes, lots of trees. You're not always going to have a back cast. Having no. that two handed rod will allow you to get a lot of line out effectively. Yeah. Yeah. No, I could see both things. I could see it'd be awesome to have a little a little spay, you know, to kind of, you know, mix that in and also have the single hand rod and just, yeah, you know, try a little bit of everything and mix it up. And it yep. sounds like room gear room. There's no, it's not like you're super strapped. Like you have to get all your stuff into a little backpack. Literally there's plenty of room to bring some, some gear. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the focus of these trips is fishing and you can't fish without a fly rod. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. Nice. Nice. Okay. Well, I think we covered this pretty well. I, I have got, I guess the one more, if I had to ask you one more here, um, it would be, uh, well, I'm going to get, I'm going to get one more tip out of you and then I'm going to get one more random question. So, so the tip is on the person that, so is coming up, getting ready for this trip. Say they're already like, okay, I'm going up on this trip. What do you tell that person? What's one thing you tell them to get prepared for, for your, your trip you do here? (laughs) Don't forget your sleeping bag. Oh, has that, has that happened before? <laughs> we have had that happen before. We have had folks yeah, for, that's forget up. you know, that's a pretty important piece of equipment. Damn. Now in that one particular instance, you know, we made it work. We went and got a bag for the, for the customer, but just, you know, for the one tip coming up here, just read the pack list, read the emails, whether it's. So you have a checklist, you actually oh, have yeah. a checklist you send oh, out. Oh yeah. Yes, definitely. Nice. Yeah. And that's, that's for anyone doing any outdoor trip, if an outfitter or your buddy sends you something, read it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So the checklist is huge. So you have this checklist that uh, anybody can walk through. Um, and is that checklist something that you can get, um, you know, you have to kind of do the trip to get a hold of that? Or is there a checklist out there they can actually get from your site or something like that? Uh, that's pretty much when a guest books a trip with us, we send them that checklist. But you know, most of your listeners and folks doing this have been out camping and, you know, there's certain things yeah. that you want to just make sure that you have. And Alaska, Alaska is, you know, no different. Uh, you know, the rain gear is, you know, next to bring in your sleeping bag for a trip, having good rain gear, good rain gear, like, like you're used to in Oregon, Washington, parts yep. of Northern California, you know, some parts back East where it rains a lot and we're not talking rains for half an hour and then the sun comes out again. We're talking, it rains all day. So having a good rain jacket, whether that be, you know, the new Gore-Tex Pro, other DWR materials, or just mm-hmm. old school rubber, but just having a good rain jacket is, is clutch. Yeah. I go, I go to the, I've definitely, I've got a little bit of everything, but uh, yeah, the, the old rubber, you know, is actually kind of nice at times when you're like sitting on the boat and you're not walking a lot. It's, yep. you know, it's, it's warm. You don't have to worry about sweating and it's definitely not, you can dump on you all day and you're good to go. But, yep. um, but nice. Okay. Well, my last one, here's the last question that I can't remember. This definitely came from somebody out there too, but they're saying he, he asked, uh, what do, uh, what, what do the guides drink? So, so what, what are you drinking out there in your, in your evening? <laughs> Um, we do like our alcohol. So most, yeah. <laughs> we're really, yeah. most of my guides are not drinking green tea at night. They're generally no. drinking, uh, bourbon. Bourbon. Yeah. So that's it. So that's the beer. The problem with beer is that although a nice IPA is very great, it's, uh, it weighs a lot, right? And bourbon actually packs yep. a better punch. Yep. Yep. But we do, like I said, we, we like our beer, you know, we're out there, we are working, we love being out there, but we are working. So we do bring beer and most of my guides and myself drink bourbon, but beer and yeah. bourbon. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm going to let you get out of here, but just give us a heads up in the next kind of nine months uh, or so. And, uh, you know, what you have coming. I know part of this is the cool thing. We haven't mentioned this, but, you know, we're working together. You know, you're a sponsor on this podcast. Obviously, by this point, um, you know, folks have, have heard what you have going. And I'm pretty excited about this whole thing because, you know, for me, the Alaska thing is one of my, you know, great things. When I first ran into you, I was like, wow, this is like exactly my, you know what I mean? Like the ultimate trip. So I'm excited for that. And, and just wanted to, to kind of put that out there as well. But uh, talk about you, like what else from now until say next year sometime, anything new? Are you going to, it sounds like you got a hunting trip coming, which sounds pretty amazing. Oh yeah. We, you know, we got to fill the freezer for the family, you know, with how busy the business has gone. It's kind of cut into my hunting time somewhat, uh, but we're still able to get out to Kodiak after our steelhead season and chase deer and chase goat there and maybe a little bit of moose hunting. Um, I'm a, I'm a dad. I have a 19 month old Mm -hmm. daughter. So whenever I'm not working, I'm doing everything I can to spend time with her. We've had her out. She's 19 months old. Wow. She's been snowboarding since she was 15 months old. She's probably got close to 25 days up here on our local uh, ski hill. Yeah, it's awesome. And then going forward, um, we are expanding operations up north, chasing you know monster she fish and big sea run Arctic char and big chum up there. So yeah, just mm-hmm. lots of fishing, lots of family time, and lots of backcountry snowboarding and snow machining. There you go. That's that. That'll fill out the year for sure. So. 
All right, Adam. Well, we'll send everybody out. Like we said, uh, fishhoundexpeditions.com if they want to connect with you or learn more about these trips. And uh, yeah, man, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I think uh, we definitely uh, got a good perspective on what it's going to take and a good resource, uh, definitely, if we want to dig into this. So yeah, looking forward to keeping in touch and everything we have coming. Yeah, Dave, looking forward to it, man. There you go. That's a wrap. That's all we have for you today. If you want to check out the show notes, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash 324, 324. We'll get you all the good stuff we talked about today on the show, and we'll connect you to some of the resources and other things that we covered. If you get a chance, would love it if you could uh, click that subscribe button. It's a good way to, if you haven't already, uh, subscribe. You can uh, get updated when that next episode goes live. And, uh, and it's going to be going live pretty quick. We got these things uh, just running out here about as fast as you can catch a, uh, a rainbow trout in Alaska. It's the same rhythm, same speed we have going with our, with our uh, episode cadence. It's, uh, it's like catching a big, giant rainbow trout, Alaskan rainbow trout on a mouse pattern. That's the experience we're going for, so I'm glad we were able to shed some light on today. I hope you get a chance to connect with uh, with Adam, connect with me. We're going to be doing some cool stuff this year. we got a big, big trip coming up later this year that's going to be uh, massive and amazing, and uh, and would love to connect with you on that one. But go over there and check, out, uh, check it out right now, Fishhound Expeditions. Go uh, take a look at some photos, dig a little deeper into Adam if you have any interest in in an Alaskan trip, um, click that button on Adam's, um, click that page. He's got a place in there. You can get some more information on the trips. And he always loves a call. If you want to give him a call, check in with him, pick his brain, um, and find out how you can put together one of these amazing trips. So I am excited for this year. I'm excited to be getting this out. And, and I hope to see you as always. I hope to see you on the water, hopefully up on the Alaskan water. Um, And if I can't do that, I hope to connect with you online. Wet Fly Swing, give me a shout out if you're still listening on social media. I would love to hear from you. Just send a quick DM and let me know you're listening all the way till the very end of this episode. And we're just about ready to take it out of here. Appreciate you. Appreciate the support. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.